Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Nicole Frankel, a board member of Temple Emmanuel and chair of our membership committee. On behalf of our members and the Stryker Center, I'm excited to welcome you to celebrate an institution that is not only beloved by New Yorkers, but one that has come to uniquely represent the city itself. We come together at a time when our hearts are heavy with the pain of what Ukrainians are suffering. So many of us, including Temple Emmanuel, are working to offer them material support. Tonight's event reminds us of our intimate Jewish connection to Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands of us trace our roots to Odessa, Kyiv, and other cities and towns where our families lived peacefully until pogroms ravaged Ukrainian Jewish life, destroying homes, businesses, entire villages, and killing thousands. That violent anti-Semitism spurred wave after wave of emigration to our American shores. Louis and Lillian Zabar were among those who fled, and in Louis's case, after his father fell victim to the hatred. But like all of our ancestors, they persevered and rebuilt their lives. The Zabars opened a humble fish counter in a dairy store on the Upper West Side on West 80th Street. Over time, it morphed into a modest 22-foot-wide Jewish appetizing store on the corner at Broadway. But then Louis and his sons proved they not only understood food, they understood business, and they had a vision. They saw where the appetites of New Yorkers were heading. First, they added not just new types of fish, like hot smoked kippered salmon and pickled lox, but also exotic peppercorns, gourmet mustard, and a dazzling array of cheese. Their business exploded. Their 22-foot wide shop became a 20,000 square foot gourmet paradise, and the Zabar family became Epicurean royalty. Over the past several years, Louis's granddaughter, Lori Zabar, illuminated this fascinating culinary journey in a book called Zabar's, A Family Story with Recipes. Last fall, we were excited to schedule an evening with Lori to discuss growing up in her family's iconic store. But sadly, she passed away in February, and we are honored tonight that many of her loved ones are here with us, including her father, Stanley Zabar, her nephew, Willie Zabar, her brother and Zabar's executive director, David Zabar, and Zabar's store manager, Scott Goldshine. We are also pleased to be joined by Julia Moskin, a lifelong New Yorker and food reporter for the New York Times since 2004. They join us this evening to celebrate not just Zabar's, but Lori's life and her passion. They will share their personal stories, as well as Lori's priceless stories of eccentric customers, celebrity fans, and the devotion to food that transformed a Ukrainian immigrant's small shop into an iconic New York institution. Their conversation will be moderated by the esteemed Gabrielle Gershenson, James Beard Award-nominated food journalist and an editor of the 100 Most Jewish Foods and On the Hummus Route. If you are joining us online, you can submit your questions via the chat function. If you are here, you will have a chance to ask questions directly at the end of the program. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Zabar clan, Julia Moskin and Gabriella Gershenson. Uh, hello, everyone. Let's uh, definitely give some encouragement to our, our guests. Um, maybe we'll go around the front. Sorry, we're locked in. We'll figure this out. I think this is the best way, guys. And gentlewoman. I'll stay at this end. I think I took the mic from that chair, though. Yeah, this will take about 10 minutes, so like, you know, have a sandwich, go outside, have a cigarette, whatever, whatever you need to do. Use the bathroom. Either way. 
Okay, now we're going to do that one more time. Um, welcome, welcome, uh, Stryker Center in person audience. So nice to see you. And welcome, virtual audience. It's so great to have you here. Um, I think that the virtual audience. We need a hat. We all need a hat. Actually, I'm a little upset that I don't have a hat. I was going to talk to you about that, Stanley. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. I always wear the hat. My wife doesn't care for me to wear it in house, but I do anyway because the lights are bright. Well, I think in the house of worship, it's very appropriate. Um, so there are going to be questions at the end. Um, please, virtually, you can ask your questions. Um, in some technological way that I know is shared with you at the beginning of the program, and their index cards are going to be passed around to all of you here in the audience. So as uh, Saul is getting settled, maybe we'll start at the very end. This is an unusually large panel for us. It's very exciting. Um, but I'm just going to have uh, Julia, you can begin perhaps maybe if you could introduce yourself, and we'll just go down the line so you can all tell us who you are. Oh, sure. Well, I think Nicole told, told you guys the, the basic outlines, but my main qualification for being on stage is that I have lived on the Upper West Side since 1968 and <laughs> pretty much grew up um, at Zabar's and Barney Greengrass and Murray Sturgeon Shop. I have to put in a little, they're still there too. And there were so many Jewish businesses at that time, so it's changed a lot, um, but Zabar stays the same. All right, Scott, your turn. Uh, I'm Scott Goldshine, and I'm the general manager of Zabar's. I've been there for 45 years, which means I started at 17. Uh, thank you. I'm still here, and live on the and live on the Upper West Side, and I'm gainfully employed by Zabar's. Hi, I'm Willie Zabar. I'm the social media coordinator of Zabar's and the host of the Zabar's podcast. I've been working there since I was 16 years old, which is three years after I was bar mitzvahed right here at Temple Emmanuel. Hi, I'm David Zabar. I'm the executive director of Zabar's. I've worked there since I was about 12, on and off, not continuously. You know, fully, full time for only the last 40 years. And I'm, I'm Saul Zabar. And, uh, uh, I really, I've been there since I'm a kid, so I don't, uh, I can't, can't tell you exactly how many years I've been there. I'm 93, so, uh, uh, and I know that uh, uh, Stanley and I were working uh, on Sundays uh, when we were going to, uh, when we were going to grade school, uh, which will tell you about the reason for which. Uh, the, uh, we had to come in on Sundays because the uh, blue laws, uh, the, that, uh, the church blue laws uh, only allowed us to stay open from eight to, eight to 11 and from four to seven in the afternoon. So they, they needed Stanley and myself to fill in for the staff. And uh, so we were there every Sunday. Okay. All right, last but not least, Stanley. Uh, I'm uh, Saul's brother. Stanley Zabar. Uh, I'm uh, four years younger than Saul. Uh, Saul uh, is almost every day now uh, in the store. You'll, if you come in, you'll see him rolling a, uh, a cart, uh, looking like as if, he's, as if he's shopping, since he doesn't allow, they don't allow these rollers that he has outside in the store, so he has to have something to support and looks around and they think he's checking out everything. So <laughs> makes me feel comfortable that I don't have to be there when he is there. Uh, anyway, uh, we moved into uh, 81st Street in Amsterdam um, in uh, 1930. Two was it in 1930, 1930, 1930. In 1932, I was born, and um, I had an a, a, a mastoid. So we still were on uh, 81st Street 
on the top floor of Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, there's a building there now, and I was very lucky to see the Iceman put, bring big chunks of ice, five flights up, and we had a uh, ice box. You put the, uh, a, uh, the ice in it, and then the next day he came and he brought more ice. So but then we moved down to the middle of the block about three or four years later, and finally ended up at 219 West 81st Street, right in the corner of Broadway and 81st Street. And it was very good for me because uh, I and Saul initially went to uh, PS9, which is on 82nd Street, for our basic elementary school uh, going forward. And uh, I used to work on Sundays to uh, help my father, who uh, we were open from 8 o'clock in the morning till midnight, and uh, help my father take a nap on Sunday and maybe on Saturday, and uh, we would come down and help uh, watch the store while he uh, was uh, napping. So we've always been involved in, in the store one way or another. And we've had, basically the store was like a center of the family. You always knew where your mother and father were or where your cousins were. And every cousin or family member or others that we, part of the friends that needed a job always was able to get one at the Zabar's. And so uh, we've been a close family. And right now, all, most, almost 90% of our own family and uh, my brother, uh, younger brother who lives on the east side, everything we're in within a radius of 10 blocks of, uh, throughout most of our lives. So she, she called it the close. shtetl in the book, I think. Your, your daughter called it the, sh the shtetl, the 10 block shtetl, and uh, as far as I know, Saul, you never lived outside of that 10 block radius in, in otherwise, or other than your time in um, school in the Midwest, right? You went to college in, in Kansas City, but otherwise you were living within that 10 block radius around Zabar's, is that right? I'm not quite, I'm not, I, I didn't quite hear what you had to say. Do it without the microphone. You know, um, are you asking about the founders of Zabar's? No, but we can talk about that, though. Why don't we talk about your grandfather, Louis? My, that was our father. Excuse me. Your grandfather, Louis. Um, that was just a save. You know, it's okay. It's all right, David. We don't have to talk about your grandfather, Louis, you and I. But let's talk about the Zabar's and how they came to this country. Um, you used to be called Zabarska. Was that your last name in Ukraine? And yes, yeah, Zabarka. 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 It went down to Zabar after we've, uh, I don't know when it became Zabar from Zabarka. So, do you know? No. <laughs> um, when did they, um, and um, when, did dad, when did dad come to this country? In 1920, 21, that's a whole story, a whole different story. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, know he, I know he worked in a farmer's market in Brooklyn for uh, the, the Zion. He, he worked, first of all, we have some documentation where he was, was uh, um, he gave some material to um, an organization describing the pogroms that uh, were taking place in his in the Ostropolia area, uh, where he came from, and they, uh, they've been recorded. So we have a copy of the uh, description of, the, of what was going on there, and uh, then uh, uh, we found it on the internet, actually. And then uh, he, um, uh, he went into Canada. Um, he, he didn't have a, a, a documentation for the States. So he, uh, he, he, went, he was able to get into Canada, and from Canada he came down uh, illegally uh, to New York. Uh, he had relatives, in, he had some relatives in Canada, and he came down illegally in New York and uh, uh, was worked as an illegal immigrant until the, um, the, in the 1940, uh, 41, 42, 43, they declared an amnesty 
uh, for uh, for illegals, and he became a citizen. At that, at that time, though, he was already a prosperous businessman, and he was at risk of being uh, sent back to where he came from during the height of World War II and the Holocaust. Is that is that right? Uh, like the, that was what was so interesting about the story that Louis did not gain citizenship until the 40s when he was already very established and you were all living quite a nice life. He owned many shops, he had um, real estate. And what was it that got him on the brink of being sent back to, to Ukraine? Was it legal problems or do you recall what the situation was? I, I don't think, were you involved with that? I, well, I didn't understand the word. That, she, she, said, <laughs> she said that he was always worried of being set, sent back to the Ukraine. Do you remember that? Because that was beyond, I was too young to hear. I never heard him voice it, but, but he lived in fear. He lived in fear that, and, and there were probably threats uh, that he would be exposed. My mother, of course, was a, was a citizen and came and, and lived with relatives in Philadelphia. Uh, and, but, but he was not, he, he, he was not legal and he was always worried that um, he, he didn't have a driver's license. He, he, he didn't have any of the things that, that a citizen would have. And he was always concerned that he would be, um, that he would have problems. I think it, it's much clearer in the book, and not that I'm selling the book, but she, but my oldest daughter who died uh, within the three months of uh, here, who did not uh, see the production, the printing of it, uh, although the the uh, uh, printers, the the uh, 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 book companies were very excited that she was so clear as to what was happening and the information you get. And there was a great deal of information that she uh, put in the book that we never knew of. So we can uh, share that with you by uh, getting the basic book. Uh, either go to the library if the $18, $19 is out of your uh, way, uh, and uh, they'll be, we're going to see that the, the, uh, the 82nd Street Library is going to have a few books, so you can read it uh, there, uh, and, uh, but uh, a lot of... They're also for sale. You can, you can buy one here, and it's, it is a beautifully researched book. It's extraordinary. Um, Lori uncovers facts about your family that you mentioned you never knew before, and she writes with great humor and incredible um, just research went into this. Um, uh, unbelievable. And Julia, I, I would love to maybe throw it to you for a moment as, you know, one of the only people on stage who is not part of the Zabar's family. Uh, I think that is really interesting to maybe hear your perspective about the role that the Zabar's play in New York life or in food life. Because in this book, um, your business partner, Marie Klein, he called Zavars the uh, Jewish royalty, which I think is actually very accurate. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I would love to just hear your take. Well, you know, I think um, uh, when I was young before, Zavars was such uh, a big presence in American culture before all the movies that it's been in, before Woody Allen put it in his films, before everyone talked about Zavars. It was kind of a local <clears throat> treasure. Now, we have to remember, I think there were a lot more places that were somewhat like Zabar's around um, not in, in every Jewish neighborhood. But people were on, in the neighborhood were much less observant then. And so the fact that Zabar's also served ham and you know didn't seem to be especially kosher also, I think, made it very approachable. Um, for some reason that I don't know, it was open very late at night, so you could go to the movies on Saturday night and then go to Zabar's. So it was just kind of a, a place that felt like it was for the whole neighborhood, but special. Well, I, I just, a very important uh, uh, person in our life of Zabar's itself was Murray Klein. Murray Klein was a partner of ours and uh, he really helped develop 
the store, and uh, a lot of, uh, very important to read uh, the, the book because he was part, uh, he was in Russia, he sold uh, during the war uh, bread, he took the money that was paid in gold to him and put it up uh, in certain secret places in his body. Early, he was in a camp, he was, a, he was in a displaced person's camp, and his cousin Aaron Klein found him and brought him to the States. So he was, uh, he was a, you know, he, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting that he was able to come from the, and in the camp he did business. He, 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 uh, he liked business and he, and he did business in gold and he kept it and, uh, in, in gold coins and he had to keep the gold coins in his tuchus. tuchus. <laughs> but his, his cousin Aaron Klein brought him here to the, found him, brought him to the States and he worked for his, his cousin had a, had a store on the, on the east side or in, or in, uh, uh, and, uh, Aaron Klein walked into the uh, into Zabar's one day and he says, I can't work for my cousin. They're stealing him blind. And I can't work in a place where this where people are stealing for one another. So that's how we acquired Aaron Klein, who became the spearhead of Zabar. So we, we read well, I read in the book, you will read in the book, that Marie Klein was he was the business partner who you had brought in Saul to help revive the business um, around like I guess mid mid century, and he made some really interesting innovations that I'd love. Maybe David, you could speak to this. I, I have to correct something. Yeah. Uh, Aaron uh, worked for uh, us, and we had a, plan, a store on 96th Street and Broadway, and he worked uh, for us as a manager. I remember that uh, uh, that was uh, sorry that Aaron was the uncle that brought him in. Murray was the person that worked for us due to Aaron. Aaron was a partner in other things of, with my father, and Murray uh, ran this 96th Street store at, like a, a gem. And uh, moving uh, quickly forward, he, uh, he uh, one day he went and opened his own business and he didn't like being alone, and therefore, he was closed his own business, and they came back, and I said to him, Aaron, you must come to Zabar's because Zabar's is has a problem. We're not we're losing money all the time, and you were able to do it. So he came uh, in there, and then he tremendous conflict between him and Saul. But of course, Aaron did not want anybody to to run the business. He only wanted to run the business. So. That's the beginning of the story of, uh, of, of Murray and Saul and us that began the whole thing of the creation of Zabar's as it is today. So that's in uh, about the uh, 1950s. Uh, What's even more interesting, the, the man that brought uh, my father to Broadway, his name was Charlie Raffa. And he don't say any, and not about the money or anything. I know. No, <laughs> no he, he he brought he uh, he was the immigrant broker for immigrants and uh, also also did lend them money, did lend immigrants money, but he brought uh, uh, he brought people immigrants to various uh, operations, and um, he. Uh, of course, he was the instrument of, of, of the immigrants, and eventually he and his sons created a, a business of building markets. So they would build supermarkets for these people. And, uh, and uh, Charlie Washer, uh, Charlie Raff, excuse me, his daughter, Matilda, married Mario Cuomo. And so Matilda, Matilda Cuomo was really Matilda Raffa. And um, and and Charlie Raffa was the immigrant, uh, uh, the immigrant enabler. For uh... Uh, David and Scott, I I'd love to get your take um, just on since we're talking about employees of Zabar's. Like some of the great joys of going to Zabar's are being having interactions. I was going to say being waited on, but that's not quite right. Having interactions with the people who work there. Um, 
and Murray Klein, there's a quote um, that Laurie wrote in the book. He said, if I can walk out onto the Zabar's floor and see my shoes, it's not busy enough. And I don't even really know what that means, but I feel like it also kind of sums up the spirit of Zabar's. Um, and in the book also, she wrote how he created that bizarre atmosphere that you still have there today with all of the pots hanging from the ceiling and everything just, you know, so chock full. And I just wonder if the two of you, since you're working in the day to day, um, if you can talk to us a bit about what it's like to maintain that atmosphere that people really expect to see when they come now shopping at Zabar's. Very hard. <laughs> um, we're a much bigger store now than when Mr. Klein was there. Uh, but, and we all called him Mr. Klein. Only Saul and Stanley called him Murray. I had never heard anybody in my life ever call him Murray except for Saul and Stanley. Even his wife would call him Mr. Klein. <laughs> um, he was... Uh, Mr. Klein was tough. He was my mentor. He was... Most of the senior managers that are there now I ha were hired by him, and you had to be on your toes. And all of our work ethic, uh, besides Saul and Stanley, also came from him. And we try and run things the same way, although things are different now. Um, you have to be a little bit more flexible or lenient, but we have an in incredible bunch of employees. It's really a, it's a, it's a family operation. It really is, and all, it's like the world's oldest mom and pop. Yes, we're a big store, there's over 230 people that work there, but it, it's truly a family operation. There are grandchildren, there are husbands and wives that work there, there are children, there are grandchildren, there are people that work there. When I was a cashier, he used to joke with me that whenever I have a kid, I want you to train him. And 25 years later or so, somebody walks in the door and this is my son, give him a job. <laughs> so we do, but it's a hard place to work, but it's a great place to work. And I, I'm proud and happy to be there. And while it is tough, the fact that it really is a family atmosphere and it's not corporate by any stretch of the imagination, and the people that have been there, we have a lot of employees that have been there 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And this is their home, and they treat it like their home. And Zabar's would not be Zabar's without that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David. Uh, uh, I, I'd, like, I'd like to comment on my perspective of how Zabar's works and why it works. And going back historically, um, Saul always had a focus on quality and merchandise, and cheese. Uh, he started roasting coffee beans more than 50 years ago because he wanted to sell a better coffee that he liked. Uh, I trained under Saul uh, to be a smoked fish buyer, and after six months or a year, then for the next decade, I was buying the smoked fish. But Saul was constantly checking up on me. And uh, Stanley has a very strong business background. He went to business school, to law school, and they recognized and that Murray was really the missing piece of the puzzle. Someone that wanted to sell and to merchandise and understood people and operations and how to make things work. And the three of them each had very specific strengths that all worked together. And sometimes there was a little push and pull, or a lot of push and pull. And Scott can talk more clearly about what it was working directly with Murray and what it was like. I worked more with Saul in smoked fish and, and other things. So, uh, oh, and Sorry to interrupt, but I can tell you that I learned how not to take a sick day for over 40 years <laughs> because of Mr. Klein. And well. What was, what was different then, of course, was that we were not only open seven days a week, which we are now, but we were open till midnight and one o'clock on Saturdays. And on Saturday evening, when the theaters let out, the RKO across the street, when the uh, uh, Lloyd's 83rd, and where the people coming from their legitimate theater of the, uh, the uh, various actors and actresses, so the store was filled 
between 12 and 1 with the most interesting collection of, of people from theater, from, from every aspect of, of life. In fact, uh, my, um, one of my um, um, re reminiscences is about, uh, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember, the, 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 uh, the original fiddler on the roof. Zero Mostel. Zero Mostel. I met him, and he used to come into Zabon's, and when he walked in, he would do a show. As he walked in, it was Zero would put on a, uh, a, an impromptu show, and uh, with, with, with Zero, he would entertain everybody. And uh, one day, he, it was a Saturday, I saw him, and he looked a little bit peculiar. I said, what's the matter? He says, I'm not feeling well. And he was doing Fiddler uh, in Jersey somewhere, and that was his last performance. So I saw him on the last day of his, uh, of his life. Well, but just the comment about uh, Zero, um, I, I was on, uh, since I was going to uh, um, law school at that time, I had the midnight shift. So on Saturday night, I would uh, be the, uh, closing the uh, uh, store at uh, midnight, um, and uh, uh, my wife would say, why does that not anybody else have the, that shift? I said, well, I like it. And the truth was I did like it because Zero came in every Saturday night and he p performed for at least a half hour. And <laughs> Saul's telling how depressing it was to know that he uh, had died because he was uh, dieting according to necessary to be in a new show. And that was the rumor of why he died uh, that because he was too fat and he had to take off 20 pounds very quickly there. So be careful. Uh. <laughs> well, we had a whole group of people that lived on West End Avenue and, and Riverside Drive who were in theater, in legitimate theater. And they came there every, after their, as I said before, when their, when their shows let out, uh, usually in the 11 o'clock or 11.30, they would stop by Zabar's, and uh, so it was filled. So on, on a Saturday night, Zabar's was filled with, with theater people, with actors, with, uh, uh, it, was, it was really an amazing experience. And, and uh, you could, uh, wh who was it that pi uh, uh, drew the picture of all the actresses and actors? Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld. So that's a, uh, the copies are in the store still, but the original was sold for a lot of money there. Uh, and uh, we've always had a, a wonderful relationship. And uh, just a comment from Murray Klein, uh, that you could see the type, how he had, he would advertise that uh, you b go to Macy's to buy pillowcases and sheets and come to Zabar's for the caviar. Don't go to, that, to Macy's for caviar. That was the caviar wars, the famous caviar wars between Murray and Macy's, yes. I just want to kind of take an informal poll in the audience. How many Upper West Siders do we have in here? I think that's a big deal, actually, because, um, you know, the city's very divided, east from west. You don't all come to the Upper East Side very often, do you? You came specially for the Zabar talk, right? Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, one one t most important part uh, you have to know is that in 1950, my father died and my mother cried, and we were not uh, involved in, in the operation of the stores until 1950. Now, if you know that Saul said he's 93 now, and I'm uh, 89, and so you can figure out how many years. But we were not uh, at that time interested in going to, be, I was in the second year of uh, uh, Wharton, and uh, my mother said, you have to come home. And the saw was doing something, they, she said, they have to come home, I can't handle this there. And so we did that. So that's the beginning of our relationship with the operation of the business of Zabar's and how it worked out. You could see most of it in the book and uh, things that we didn't know that we did is in the book. 
Well, let's talk about how Zabars became the Zabars that we know today, because it's very interesting. Your father was building a supermarket empire, and you had multiple locations, which I think would make all of us very happy, right, if there were many Zabars, but they weren't all the Zabars that we necessarily think of today. So um, maybe, David, could we talk a little bit about how Zabars became the Zabars we know? Like, when did that actually happen? Well, it was a little before my time that we had, let's say, three or four different locations. Uh, I know by the early 60s, uh, we only had the current location. And, and uh, Really, feel free to chime well, in. I wasn't there either. <laughs> I think Willie could talk in a moment about how he feels Zabar is, is, is seen today you know, to the rest of the world, because we're very, like, New York-focused. You know, we, we focus on the, the Zabar store and, and what goes on there, and we're there through the, uh, the 60s and 70s as French food caught on, and Julia Child became very popular, and people wanted to take home what they had in restaurants or they'd seen in Europe, and we expanded into imported cheeses and French cheeses, and and other meats you know, uh, from Italy and other places. And as, as I said before, Saul was roasting our coffee, and we had espresso, and we sold espresso machines, and uh, you know, we were part of that whole trend. So that's the part I saw through the 60s and 70s. And then in the 80s, uh, we expanded our prepared foods, and up until then, everyone had to wait to get sliced salmon or chopped liver or coleslaw, and as we made it available, you know, grab and go, uh, you know, more, more people were taking home things for dinner and uh, they could wait for you know, personal service at the counter or they could take what they want and made things easier. I'd like to mention a, a comment that Saul made that I thought was very interesting. I would say to him, why are you spending so much time with the coffee? Because he was doing, uh, at the beginning of maybe a full weeks of the coffee, and now we're selling uh, uh, almost 8,000 uh, pounds a week of coffee on an individual one, one pound at a time. And he said, my direction is to make it taste like a fine wine that the, I'm very interested in. And if, you come up uh, uh, to Zabar's, you'll see the, uh, where he, he's able to sample uh, where he is and his uh, students, uh, which we have now working at the coffee, uh, a student would be able to uh, roast in a mini roast to taste the samples of the wine. So he spends, uh, we spent a lot of time on coffee, coffee very important. Uh, I, never, I never was able to drink coffee until Saul created the coffee as a fine wine, I felt it was. And I, later on I found that most other people selling coffee bulk was, uh, was stale. We, we, we uh, change it every Tuesday is a new batch of coffee. And Saul would say to anyone, if you want it uh, exactly fresh, you need to come in on a Tuesday. That's when the coffees co uh, come in. And, you stop by, you'll see a pound, bags and bags of coffee. So he's very, that was a very exciting. That's so that one aspect of the business. The other was he and uh, David uh, originally during by uh, early times was in the smoke fish, go, going the best smoke fish, going to the smoke fish, tasting, being able, one of the few people to be able to taste the smoke fish to know what's coming into the store. Uh, as of now, too, we are especially uh, uh, sm uh, uh, the smokefish people do, uh, most of them have moved out to South Carolina. Those that have stayed, especially for us and a couple of other uh, places there, that's why we probably sell more uh, salmon than anyone, any particular uh, store uh, there. But the f most exciting uh, situation which I was involved uh, in was the c c 
creation of the cheese department, which began by a young lady. I thought we'd get applause Alga. for cheese, guys. Come on. In the book, <laughs> uh, Alga was 17 years old, and how it happened that now she's uh, uh, f uh, 50 years, uh, she is now 67, 68 there. So she's the oldest, uh, other than us, an oldest uh, person uh, that is still working uh, at Zabar's. And we used to go to uh, France and Italy and uh, Germany to find different cheeses. So one, one time, uh, uh, Judy and I, that's my wife, Judy, by the way, in, uh, in June, Judy and I will be married for 70 years. And I, I, I want to tell you, I still love her. And I, <laughs> I miss her when she's away. Um, so uh, we went, and so she, so uh, Olga has been there from then to now. And one time we were in Paris, Judy and myself, and uh, we went into a restaurant, uh, the famous restaurant where the owner died and the, uh, the maitre d' became uh, the owner and uh, maitre d' of the, this famous French restaurant and said, the one thing I love about Zabar's is the cheese. You, a Frenchman, a cheese, you have all the cheese you want to eat. He says, but it's only French cheese. You have almost a thousand different varieties. And uh, that's why I love it. Right now, I would say uh, that an exaggeration is a thousand. I would say that the, in, in doing a listing was more like six or seven hundred uh, varieties of cheese. So you come in there. And one interesting thing that, uh, that uh, Alga would do, that since we had such volume in cheese, the uh, wholesalers would come on a Wednesday uh, and try and sell the cheese because those cheeses would be spoiled by the following Tuesday and uh, their customers would not buy. But we could... Nor would we sell them. We could sell those cheeses by Sunday. So there was no problem. There are some really charming anecdotes in this book. And Lori, I... Um, may her memory be a blessing. She did an incredible job. The book is informed and really well researched and really, really funny. How and about the, uh, recipes? The, I, my God, how could I forget the recipes? I mean, like gefilte fish and like some really nice sounding thumbprint cookies that I really want to make. Um, but Willie, I know that you're the family comedian. I, I just, I, I just want to, um, I want to read this one little bit that um, that Lori wrote. I, I just want you to laugh on cue, really. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but wait, let me read it first. Um, this oh, is a great yet. anecdote. My father once rele received a letter from a customer who was upset at finding some stray caraway seeds in a container of Zabar's cream cheese. As evidence, she had taped three seeds to the letter. Uh, Thank you so much for the letter, my father wrote back. We were looking all over for those seeds. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're a professional comedian, Willie. Like, how is that? Like, it's funny. It's definitely funny. Yeah. So, it's a solid. It's yeah. a solid. Show. Sol it's solid. It's solid humor. Okay, so um, I've listened to some of your Zabar's podcasts, actually, partly to help me prepare for tonight. And you do a wonderful job, and you have some really great. You know, I think everyone should go in home and listen to some of the episodes with Lori. All the episodes. Listen to every. Listen to all episodes. the episodes. Not that many. But can you tell me a bit about the interviews that you did with Lori? Because we really are missing her tonight. She's the one who really should be telling us about this book. And, and she does do so on your podcast. Maybe tell me a little bit about what you learned about her process from interviewing her. Right. So um, the third episode that we made was focusing on our founders, Louie and Lily Zabar. And this was, I interviewed Lori just, just over a year ago. Um, and she was putting the finishing touches on her book, so she had completed the research, and I basically said, hey, I'd like to record a conversation with you and see you know, what you can tell me about them, and she's like, well, yeah, but I'm not gonna tell you all the good stuff, okay? You gotta, gotta save something for the book. And I thought she was joking, but she said that to me every single time I saw her for the next year. 
Uh, but what we recorded this hour long interview where I'd say three quarters of it was about Louie and Lily, but the rest was about what Zabar's was like in the 60s and the 70s and everything through today. Now we used 15 minutes of that interview for episode three and then we couldn't find the rest of it. The original, the original hard drive was gone, the memory card, we couldn't find it. Uh, and we were, I was making an episode with my team, Henry and Emily. Uh, we were making an episode about the book, which is basically a condensed version of the events of the book. And I was saying, we need to, like, where is this interview? Like, how like, can we find it? And so basically we found a backup of a backup of it on my producer Emily's hard drive. And we were able to cover the whole like hour, 10 minute interview. Um, and it, there's a, this happened like last week. This happened right before we were about to release the episode anyway. So we were able to go through it and actually take some of like the, some of the most like relevant part, parts and put it into the episode. And she had just, she had just dove so deep into the research and like uh, things, uh, archives in other languages, just whole, like things that you couldn't find. I, the research I did was like the New York Times archives and I didn't, I didn't pay for it. I'm sorry, I used someone else's login. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Is this this is on the record? Um, but yeah, just she she had uh, what what I did in this podcast like barely scratched the surface of the history, and what Lori did was just this amazing accomplishment. So give a, a hand of applause for just everything she did. Yeah. Um, so Julia, you know we're we're in a synagogue, so I feel like we need to talk about the Ashkenazi. Um, element of Zabar's food, what it offers to the city in terms of Jewish culinary heritage. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what place you feel that it occupies. I mean, like, what would New York Jewish food be without Zabar's? I'm, I'm sorry, we can't, uh, I can't, uh, because we are really ec economic, ec how do you pronounce it? Ec <laughs> we, we're, 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 we're for everybody whether uh, we're uh, for Jewish, Gentile, for whatever it is, but we specialize in quality, and the quality of many of the uh, uh, kosher products is quite high, and we carry a lot of them. And uh, we also uh, carry products that are specially needed during the holidays, and, and whichever holidays are there. So uh, it, it's a broad-based uh, uh, operation that uh, Scott is pushing new products and we all look for new things and, and every type of, uh, of uh, situation. The quality is the most important thing uh, that they're paying the price um, if we get the best. That's yes, please, Julia, go ahead. I just would, I, I'm trying to think of probably the first place I ever had um, some Sephardic things like halva um, were, was probably Zabar's, but it is true that the Ashkenazi dominance of New York Jewish food sort of continues to this day. And, um, you know, it, it becomes complicated, obviously, who owns hummus? Is that a Middle Eastern food? Is it an Israeli food? Is it a Jewish food? Um, but I think that the survival of a place called Zabar's or a place like Zabar's has become so much of the identity of New York Jews. Um, you know, it's just inextricable uh, from the food, including some things that weren't traditionally Ashkenazi, like black and white cookies. Um, <laughs> and people think of that as a Jewish thing. It's apparently not. I think it's a, of German heritage. Um, and it's just become, I mean, there is, of course, the uptown, downtown split with Russ and Daughters, who we don't speak of very much. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's been interesting to see how they changed their business with the restaurants. But, um, you know, there's something about Zabers that is so unpretentious. It's so homey. And I think any New Yorker feels at home there. And I think that's important. It's not just Jewish food. And it really never was. I think Lori called it schmutzy in the book. Schmutzy or schlumpy. Schlumpy was the word that she used. I want to say one very exciting thing. What, uh, when I, I've gone back to uh, reunions at, uh, at U of P and, and other places where they bring their younger uh, siblings uh, to see what's happening in college. And we, I hear, and in elevators here, I hear that, that yes, 
I was, uh, the parents are saying, when I was a little girl, I uh, went with my father to Zabar's. Uh, there. And so there is a, a community of, of families, of history uh, of the Zabar, since of, it's uh, really, I would say, it began in 1950, although in 1932 it, there was a Zabar. But in 1950, it began after my father died and we got in Murray, and we got Saul back uh, in, who was uh, wherever he was. And <laughs> I, the only thing I was sorry about was I had to uh, end my uh, college in the, uh, Wharton. But I did finish up in the NYU in the accounting area, and then on to, uh, into law school. But it didn't, mean, it didn't stop requiring to work because my mother was there, had to be taken care of. So uh, she was a few blocks away and uh, every, we have a close family. Most of our family, as I, I tell people, uh, we live in a 10 block radius, including Eli, who is on the east side, but it's within a 10 block uh, radius. <laughs> and he, he's a, a great genius of the family. He's there whenever we're in trouble or we need any help, and uh, he's a genius, and we love his stuff, and we sell a lot of his breads and his what he produces, and he studied a lot in Europe, and quality was his most important. Quality is our most uh, important part of uh, life, and uh, it's, we're, it's, a, it's like a, a home. Uh, Zay bars there, and so we're very happy. Personnel are great, and Alger is still there, and her picture's in the in the, in the book, and she's in her 60s, and uh, we uh, people don't have to retire. I, I'd love to talk a little bit about some of your amazing employees. I feel like everyone who shops at Zay bars has their favorite like fish counter person, you know, whoever it is that is like packing your coffee. Um, I, I didn't personally know Sam Cohen, but it seems like he was a very famous fish slicer. Does anyone in this audience remember Sam Cohen? Yeah, I wow. Do. Everyone on stage? I okay. Um, there's a really beautiful description um, that Lori wrote from the book, and I think I found it here. A uh, few employees exemplified Zabar's as it was from the 1950s through the 1990s like Sam Cohen, a Holocaust survivor of slight build, great charm, and considerable intelligence, uh, who was hired in 1953. Clad in a white coat, he would take his place behind the appetizing counter where he masterfully sliced lox and smoked salmon 60 hours a week for 46 years. Zabar's was Sam's stage and the customer is his audience. He flirted with women and kibitzed with men in Russian, Polish, Hebrew, Spanish, and English. I mean, wow, like what an amazing guy. And it's, it seems like your employees all are their own special characters. Yeah, please, Scott, go ahead. Well, there's something about Sam that probably nobody else knew what he did except for Stanley. When we were open till midnights on Saturday night, my job at around six or seven, when things were quiet, I would take all the money out of the cash registers and I would take it to Sam and Sam and I would go upstairs to the office. And Sam, I believe before he came to Zabar's, he was an accountant or a bookkeeper. And Sam used to count the money every Saturday night with me. And then I would make the deposit and customers used to be upset because you couldn't get Sam on Saturday night between around 7 and 9.30. It was about 10, then he'd have to eat. So by the time he came down, it was 10.30, and there was always people that were upset because where's Sam, where's Sam? But we really couldn't tell him where Sam was because <laughs> back then we took in a lot of cash as opposed to now where it's all credit card. But, and I worked with Sam obviously for many years and one of the nicest guys I ever met. Dad, how would you characterize Sam's slices? S Sam was a great people person and he was always talking to the customer and slicing what wasn't his necessarily focus, the thin <laughs> slice you could see through, etc. Other, other slices. Sam was there for personality and he was there, he was very efficient and he kept talking and slicing and, you know, 
and customers were happy, but he did not have the thinnest slices. Let me just put it that way. Uh, tell, tell about the CPA who required to become a slack slicer that the newspapers uh, uh, has tell, okay. tell Willie so, or, uh, or David. Uh, a couple of years ago, which is now more than 20, we, we advertised for someone to work at the appetizing fish counter. And uh, you may have heard his name, Len Burke, who's been interviewed a few times. Uh, he had done some you know, culinary tours, and he did a lot of cooking, etc. He was a CPA, and he retired, you know, assuming in his 60s, and he answered this ad, and you know, he had some knife skills, and he liked people. And this, this is, you, you must, Realize that if you're in the retail business, if you don't like people, you know, you're starting off on the wrong foot. So, you know, if you like kibbutzing and, and people, and, uh, you know, he's there th Thursday and Friday, or Thursday, Thursday, Thursdays. Just, just Thursdays now. And his, letter, and his documents appear in the forward. He's in the phone. He, he also writes, and he's, what, 90? He's only 92, I think. So Len, you know, you know, found a new life behind Zabor's counter, and I think it's the highlight of his week, and he enjoys it. And I, you know, for everything I've done, I find the easiest job is serving customers behind the counter. You know, here, a little more, you want this and that. You know, if the rest of the management is much more difficult than making customers happy. But, but that's not the, oh, the real story. That's not is the that real story. <laughs> Is he was in his 90s, and he is uh, during the pandemic. Uh, his uh, 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 family did not want him to work anymore. Uh, first of all, he could get sick, and he uh, was in his 90s, and and he had to, and uh, they wouldn't let him to work. And uh, well, we if that's what his uh, his family wants, we can't uh, uh, allow him to continue. So he. Uh, he left. As he was required to leave, and about a, a well, how long uh, afterwards that uh, the Scott gone? Would be well, I'm the one that made him leave, but <laughs> I would say about a year, yeah. roughly. We he was a little. We didn't want him to get he sick. Was so depressed that he couldn't go back to Zabar that they called and they said it's okay with us. Let him work. <laughs> And so we finally agreed because we had the, the papers and so on. Here, here's a 93-year-old man we're hiring, but that's what he wanted. The customers loved it. The newspapers loved it. The Times loved it. Uh, he's, so, he's, so, he's Stanley, Stanley, he was an extremely fine writer, and his letters appear in the forward. Many of his work has appeared in the forward. They may even have collected it about his experiences at Zabar's. Um, anyway, Zabaz is Zabaz, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the last part I want to mention is that we had a, a, a in, in uh, Las Vegas, a group wanted to open a, a, a chain of restaurants uh, spelled Z-A-B-A-S. In the rest of the world, it's called Zabaz. So that's almost a conflict with Zabaz, and it would put us at risk of not being able to, uh, to name new products under the name Zabar's there. So we have to be very careful of this matter. And so we uh, had to determine what was the number of people in the, in the United States that if you said Zabar's, you would, you would, I would th they would say, oh, is that some, some place uh, in, in New York, uh, I've heard about it, that came out to be 13%, and 11% uh, by law was famous, so we won our case. So from there on in, we did not have to fight the name. Uh, let's do some questions from the audience. Um, first, can we have a round of applause for the wonderful panelists? Thank you. Uh, you guys are amazing, and like you're not really interrupting each other, which is shocking, but it's not too late because this, these are free-for-alls, these questions. Um, anyone can take it. Uh, when did Zabar's start selling babka and why? Did Lily bring a recipe for babka with her from the old country? Well, 
we started selling babka. We've had a few different variations of babka, but the one that we've had for the last 25, 30 years. If I had to quit Zabar's and sell babka and rugala, I can retire. <laughs> it is, of all the things that we sell, and of all the things that we do mail order, which has become a gigantic part of the business, babka and rugala is by far the number one item. Um, when did Bapa become a thing? What? When did Bapa become a thing? It, you know, we, I would say for the last 20 years, it's really been, it's been hugely popular, and even, and the last 10 years, it's even gone to a different level, which I didn't think was possible, but the amount, that, certainly the amount that we ship during the Christmas holidays and Thanksgiving is, it's mind-boggling. I, I would like, I would like uh, to get Scott, some why do people the, love the chocolate babka so much? I don't know. I like the cinnamon better. But I'm not everybody, everybody likes chocolate. I would like to get some clarity on the bagels at Zabar's. Because, of course, for many years, H&H &H bagels was literally across the street. And I think many people assumed that your bagels were H&H &H bagels. Were they? Yes. They, uh, they, they were. I'm just waiting to see if I'm allowed to answer this question. <laughs> It's proprietary. Uh, they were for uh, I say our mail order bagels are better than any bagels in the city of New York. <laughs> and we only eat at home our own mail order bagels, not the store bagels, although they're good, as good as anybody in the, uh, anybody in the city. But the bagels that you, we ship out by, uh, by mail that come and you freeze them, uh, sli you slice them, freeze them, and they can be uh, eaten uh, within a month or two, and they are delicious and wonderful and kosher. Okay. Um Kosher bagels, and here's a really interesting question. I, I'm really curious to hear your answers. Is there much pilfering at Zabar's? We worry about that. We don't know because we're still, uh, we still are not very deep in the uh, arithmetic of what's, uh, uh, what's happening. At the end of the year, if there's some monies left, we share it with our uh, major uh, 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 personnel, which we have a group of, uh, of five top uh, uh, people, and we have the us that, who are uh, the uh, basic owners and eventually come uh, to the younger people who eventually own. Uh, I, I was thinking more like from the olive barrel, but maybe, you know, cash register, that's fair game too. But uh, the pilfering question, I think, is more like, are there people just eating food off of your shelves in well, the store? I, it, I, it's is that how you understood that question? Customers, and then it's pilfering if it's employees. Is that the definition? Is I, that? Yeah, I don't know if the pilfering person asked is, is in the audience or came from like the internet. We're criminals. Well, you know, if you're talking about customers, we're in New York. People steal. Yeah. Period. Oh, oh. No, and they always have and. We catch them, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. But we're no different than any other store when it comes to that. But Lily Zabar was very good at watching this store. She was fantastic. When I was, she used to come in when, obviously, I was younger, and she would come up to me and say, look at that person. She's got something in her bag. And 80% of the time, she was right. <laughs> Not all the time, because I got embarrassed a few times. So I learned how to approach people differently, but she was right most of the time. And this is actually is a uh, little known fact that I learned about from the book and Lori's research is that in the old country, Lily's family owned a tavern, which is very uncommon for Jews in Eastern Europe. So she had experience dealing with rough customers from a very young age. I'd like to make uh, so something that's really uh, important to me and uh, I think it's wonderful for customers and so. You know, uh, during, uh, as a result of uh, uh, certain uh, uh, laws that have been passed uh, that if you have any paper bags that you have to charge the customer for the paper bag and then you send that into 
uh, government to collect that, and the paper bag, uh, when the rain comes, the breaks, and uh, it's a, a mess. So a group of our, uh, uh, including uh, uh, Scott and his uh, gang of uh, four there, uh, determined that we got to have something that we can uh, sell uh, very inexpensively and is great. And so they developed a, uh, a, 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 a mini, uh, a, a, what would you call it? Reusable mini, plastic bag. A mini bag and a large bag uh, as the bags that had to be uh, uh, purchased for 15 cents, although they cost us uh, between 30 and 50 cents, and another one that is sold for a quarter, that would be maybe, let's say, it costs us 50 cents uh, there. And these bags are so strong and so beautiful because they were originally a designer that was made uh, for us many years ago for our big shopping bags there. And I, I suggest everyone look at it. And the strange thing is, here is a bag that is unique, costs us twice to three times the amount that we have to pay to, to have it, but we love it because if you see in the streets the Zabar bag, it's all over, and in the, the nighttime with the lights there, it's a shiny, so it looks beautiful, and we see it throughout the country. Why that 20% uh, of the people don't want to spend 15 cents and they carry the food in their hand, home, <laughs> and they drop one piece and so on. And, and these, the bags that we sell are waterproof <laughs> and, and strength, strong. And here is something we do that, that created a, a year or two of work. And how do we make it that they understand that this is really a great find for the people? And they can bring in that bag and use it again and again and again. And, and we use it at home, we give gifts in it. It's fabulous. So we, we do a lot of things for our own desires and our own uh, hope of making uh, life easier and better for us and for the customer. So that's why Zabar's is, is unique in, in that. And the, and the personnel are interested in the customer. And they're not just there to uh, pack it or do something. They look for new products and so on. So we're different. They're, they're, they're the best, not just different, but the Good best. Good night, everybody. Um, <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Or are we done? Are we, are, do we have time for one more question? We're, we're here. All right. All right, guys. It's enough already. We're, we're, we're I guess used, Stanley's done, we're, or Saul's we're, done. We're used to long hours. It's, it's not even midnight. And up here, you can't hear what's being said. OK. Um, last question for the evening. And um, Saul, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Uh, who originally created the recipes for what you make and sell? I couldn't understand what you said. It wasn't a who created the recipes for what is made in the store, why we have a better uh, chicken salad, why we have a better <laughs> whole store. why we have all these are handmade, uh, and we have a whole shift. We didn't even talk about the uh, how many how many cooks do you have in the in the cooking and making our fresh foods, uh, uh, Scott? How many people in the kitchen? How many people how in many the kitchen? We have about in the back. We have a kitchen staff of about 30, 35 people. So uh, we're we're always trying to produce something that we like, we eat. Uh, we're one step above. Uh, Eli, because Eli says, if I don't like it, I won't sell it. Uh, that's uh, hard for us to accept that, but that's a, some more or less what we, we do. If it's not right, we don't sell it uh, there. And we, if it's uh, bad, we dump it. Uh, we don't uh, use it. So we're, we're interested in the product, in the customer, 
in our uh, own uh, relationships between personnel and and the, and the, us who have been uh, working there 50, 60 years, and maybe in the, I, I at the same time was working as a lawyer and and as a other things, and but Zabar's was a uh, primary and. Uh, uh, Scott has been involved, and Saul has been involved. Um, so, David, in, in the book, Lori wrote about some uh, tastings that would happen in your home, and I'm sure, Stanley, you were involved in this, too, of different, when you were doing prepared foods, I think, in the 70s, when that was starting to be part of the, um, the offering, that you would have evenings at home where you would just try different things that were being made for, you know, from the kitchen. Well, I, I'll answer that by just going back a little bit on Stanley's answer, which is really all the prepared foods we have now and that we produce for people to take home. Going backwards, my grandmother Lily made the coleslaw and she, or the uh, potato salad or the, the cucumber salad. And to this day, Saul oversees the pickled herring, which we get barrels of herring and make cream sauce and onions and, and we make the coleslaw and everything. So most of those original recipes came from my grandmother and then we've evolved into you know, the, the uh, prepared foods that we make now. Uh, there was a period of time when we were focusing on lamb and rack of lamb, and uh, I may have been away at school for much of it, but Lori experienced tasting many times a week variations of rack of lamb. I think maybe that's what she mentioned. Judy said she used to like rack of lamb, but after Stanley made me eat, the family had to eat it for seven days and determine whether it was uh, appropriate. Uh, she done no longer orders it as a specialty. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>